Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Lahari and today I'm going, I am going to discuss with you uh, CBCT which is Cone Beam Computed Tomography. Why CBCT? Why do I need to know about it? It's because digital dentistry is evolving from two-dimensional imaging to volumetric approach also called as three-dimensional imaging and you don't want to be left behind. The learning outcomes for this lecture would be to list five advantages and uses of com cone beam computed tomography, also called as CBCT, to illustrate the principle of CBCT, to identify the clinical applications of CBCT and categorize the strengths and limitations of CBCT. Now, all of these learning outcomes are um, have been specifically derived for you at a student or an undergraduate level. Terminology before we start the lecture is first of all CBCT itself, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, pixel which is a picture element, voxel is the tiniest distinguishable element of a 3D object, FOV, field of view, the size of the area being imag imaged, MPR that is multi-planar reformatting. Two-dimension versus three-dimension, two dimensions are digital images are composed of picture elements or pixels. When you're talking about three dimensions, you have the third dimension, which is depth and uh, or otherwise X axis, Y axis and the Z axis. And that element is called as a voxel. So volume element is called as a voxel. It enables you to specifically visualize um, the in three dimensions, a particular area which has to be examined. For example, this Rubik's cube here. One of the square that you're seeing, the yellow one is a pixel, whereas the entire volume of the cube itself is a voxel. So um, in three dimensions, the generally the terminology that we use to describe the planes or the seg sections that we are viewing an image in would be the coronal section, which is the facial part of the section, axial section, also called as a transverse section, and sagittal section, which cuts up the face into half or the midline, that is called as a sagittal section. The difference between a two-dimensional and three-dimensional imaging uh, for example, when you're comparing panoramic versus a CBCT would be that the panoramic is uh, actually a slit beam or a fan beam of x-rays, which only um, expose one particular area in the focal trough and gives you a two-dimensional image of that particular area in the focal trough versus a cone beam computed tomography, which has a volumetric imaging and uses a cone of x-rays like shown in the picture over here and helps you visualize all objects that lie within that conical area of exposure and it is best suited for the head and neck region because of its ease, convenience as well as availability and other factors which we will discuss. So there is difference in the collimation, the range of exposure factors and filtration as well. When you compare a CT scan versus a CBCT, definitely the CT has, uh, for example, a helical CT has uh, the x-ray tube and the detectors move in a helical pattern around the patient's uh, body and expose the single area multiple times to give you a 3D volumetric uh, image. Whereas in that case of cone beam CT, it only exposes a conical shape of area within the head and neck region. So the basics that you need to understand is that first of all, um, there are three main processes. That is image production, visualization, and then only you interpret the image. A, the, a 3D cone or pyramid shaped divergent x-ray beam is directed through the patient into a detector. The detector is the sensor which captures the image. During the exposure, the x-ray generator, that is the source of the x-rays, and the detector, that is which catches the uh, x-rays, rotate around the patient's head. So your patient is standing still just like a panoramic x-ray machine. In fact, we use the same machine which is called as a a uh, three-in-one machine which is able to switch from a panoramic mode to a CBCT mode. The scan time can be quite fast from as fast as five seconds to about 20 seconds. So virtually very similar to that of a panoramic imaging. 
Most CBCT units have a small footprint. That means they are easy to place in your office setup. And even if you have a small office in an urban setting, a CBCT unit can fit into it and you can have an enclosed space for that uh, unit, which is, of course, uh, uh, enough radiation protection in place. Patient stabilization. Patient's head must be immobilized to get a good final image. That is one very important requirement. So there are uh, chin cup or, or bite fork uh, which are present in the machine itself which allow you to stabilize the patient's head with ease. When it comes to dose optimization, the principle of ALARA, exposure factors should be adjusted on the basis of the patient's size and specific diagnostic tasks. So this is where the element of expertise or skill comes into play. Uh, you need to take care that you are uh, adjusting the uh, exposure factors based on whether it's a child or an adult or whether your patient is big sized or a small female or a large male and um, what is the specific area of task that you or the task area that you want to see. Are you looking at a small area, large area? So the cone beam computer tomography software allows you to adjust all of these to give your uh, patient the least exposure with the best um, image that you would want to see. There are different types of CBCT gantries. They could be a seated uh, CBCT, the standing patient position CBCT or a supine one very similar to the CT scans. Now the one that is most common and uh, uh, commonly used is a standing patient position one and it even allows the patient who is on a wheelchair, it can be lowered down for a patient who is on a wheelchair to uh, give you access to the patient. But um, Yes, it can be quite tricky uh, when you are actually exposing radiation for a patient on a wheelchair, but it can definitely be used. And definitely the standing one is the most commonest and preferred one in dental settings. Let's come to the field of view. Now, this is a very important term and it actually determines the area being examined. Now, in this picture, you've seen various different areas that are scanned. So, based on the size of the area that you would want to see, all of the machines, almost all of the varieties that are available in the market, allow you to choose which area you want to see and how, should, how big should be the imaging area. So the field of view is essentially the size of the area being imaged and most CBCT machines have predefined FOV so that you don't really need to wor worry about what is the area that you want to image. You could have a small 5 times 5 or um, CM area just to see probably the ma mandibular and maxillary anteriors or if you have a single unit, a single uh, implant being placed then probably this FOV is enough and because you must understand that smaller the FOV, the lesser the radiation. Larger the area, the more the radiation. So you have an 8 by 8 available, 12 by 9, which gives you one TMJ to the other TMJ view. You have a 16 by 10, which gives you a larger view, including the maxillary sinuses and up to the orbits, or a complete 15 by 15 view, which is of applications in ENT. So in a regular dental setting, uh, machines which allow you up to 12 by 9 view are commonly used. How do you choose the right FOV? Uh, again, your radiographer can help you choose it or you could choose it for the patient based on the task that is um, that is required. For example, endodontic purposes where you have to see a single tooth, complex RCTs, single implants, smaller FOV is better. It is enough to cover three to four three teeth and to cover the uh, area of interest. If you have to look at the entire arch, an 8 by 8 or an 8 by 9 view is selected. If you have to see both arches, right and left, then based on the availability in the machine, either a 12 by 9 or a 13 by 10 view can be um, used. For example, if you're doing multiple implant placements. For the sinuses and TMJs, it is important that you have a 16 times 9 or 18 times 10 area of field of view. One very important aspect that I would want to remind you is that smaller the field of view, better the resolution. So if you are using CBCT for a small area like an endodontic area, endodontic reasons like examining a crack in a tooth or um, the root canal complexity, a smaller FOV would give you more image clarity. 
more on the field of view is just to show you the overview um, again is the recommended recommended applications change with the area that you see so you can go through this whether it's for endodontic purposes or when you want to examine requiring high level of detail this is exactly what i'm telling you you use a smaller fov but when you want to scan through a larger area then it gives you um, both the arches for example with a wider fov Let's move on to the term called multiplanar reformatting. So when you open the CBCT software, it gives you four different windows. This is the interface of a CBCT. After exposure, this is something how it will look like. So you see the same area of the skull. This is on the skull which you have imaged in three different planes. You see it in the coronal section sagittal section and the axial section at the same time and the beauty of the software is that as you move your cursor through one of the sections it moves all three sections at the same time so you get to image one particular tooth in that section and you're able to see the same tooth in all three dimensions Multiplanar reformatting continued. This is what we mean by the coronal section, axial or the panoramic section. Now, panoramic slice is something which is generated automatically in some of the X-ray machines or some of the CBCT software or some of them you have to manually generate it. The cross-sectional slices is like cutting up this uh, apple from the anterior to the posterior. The axial section would be from top to bottom and the panoramic slice is like taking one particular layer of the um, or a peel of the uh, section area. Sagittal view I haven't shown you in this picture here. So this is how the axial view looks like and the cross-sectional or the uh, uh, view of the coronal sections. So it gives you a detail of the area to be imaged in these planes. Similarly, the panoramic slice, you either generate it manually or the X-ray machine does it for you. The software does it for you um, based on the chosen site for your panoramic slice. So it's virtually very similar to looking at a panoramic radiograph after you have done a 3D volumetric imaging of the patient. So it is always a 3D in anatomy of a tooth. This is example of an extracted tooth and its anatomy it gives you details of the pulp, pulp chambers, the um, root morphology and the crown morphology in much, much more detail. And this is example of how it would look like from all different planes. So when should you ask for a CBCT scan? The images should only be used when a lower dose examination like a periapital or panoramic radiograph cannot provide necessary information. Now, just because you have CBCT scan access, we don't recommend it for all patients because there is a certain amount of cost involved and radiation exposure involved. So the uses of a CBCT scan would be, for example, for implants, difficult impactions, maxillofacial trauma, complex endodontic cases, large pathology extending in the maxilla, and orthodontic cases where there is, for example, abnormal dilacerated roots or even orthognathic surgeries where it is important to see um, uh, all the facial structures and the area that is lying within the um, surgical field. So let's look at some examples of the role of CBCT. For example, the role of CBCT in the removal of an impacted third molar. What are we looking for actually? The parameters to be assessed are the state of impaction, what is the angulation of the tooth, root details, uh, you want to look at the development morphology and the number of roots, you want to see the surrounding bone and the related pathology and you also want to see most importantly for a mandibular um, molar the relationship between the tooth and the mandibular canal. Now, the two-dimensional imaging, which is in A and C, allows you to fairly uh, guess how close the tooth is to the root uh, or, you know, what is the uh, involvement of the mandibular canal and the root. But only when you do a three-dimensional imaging, it actually gives you a very clear picture as to how close it is to the root and how close it is to the uh, tooth or the crown. 
So radiological examination strategy before taking a panoramic um, or before taking a removal of the third molar should be first a panoramic or an intraoral periapical as a first choice followed by CBCT or a low dose CT if it's not giving you the exact information that you're looking for. Now this is the uh, radiographic classification of impacted third molars which I found on, and as a very interesting article which classifies them from class 0 to class 7 based on how close the mandibular canal is to the uh, tooth and the roots. So this gives you an idea as to how difficult your extraction would be and what you should expect when you have a mandibular canal which is very close to the roots and how you would want to modify your uh, surgical technique. So based on um, the previous knowledge that we know, mesioangular impactions amount to 43% of cases and, and they are the least difficult compared to horizontal impactions and vertical impactions or distoangular ones which are the most difficult to extract. So based on your impaction on your scout image or the principal image that you've taken an IOPAR or panoramic, you would want to determine if a CBCT is required in case of difficult impactions. This is an example of an difficult impaction um, and it shows you that the tooth which is distoangular impacted is very close to the roots of the seven, uh, the adjacent seven and hence a CBCT was ideal in this case to determine how close it is to the roots and helps you assess the uh, difficulty of uh, surgery or helps the surgeon plan ahead before the surgery that in, so that there are no surprises. In endodontics, again, I want to remind you that the smallest field of view is generally recommended. When do you use CBCT in endodontics? For confirmation of non odontogenic causes of pathosis like sinusitis, for complex dentoalveolar trauma, uh, severe luxation injuries, suspected horizontal root fractures, extremely complex root canal systems prior to endodontic management, for example, a class 3 or 4 dense evaginatus, extremely complex root canal anatomy in non-surgical endodontic retreatment cases, root resorption cases, endodontic treatment complications when you're suspecting a perforation, pre-surgical assessment of complex periradicular surgery, example for posterior teeth. This is just an example of a complex endodontic case where clinically the fracture line or the crack line was not visible. Patient was in pain and the panoramic on the IOPAR could not show, visibly show any fracture line. The fracture line was visible on a CBCT image which is indicated with this blue arrow here and thus helped the endodontist understand at what level the fracture was, where the fracture was and what the treatment has to be done. In orthodontics, what is the role of CBCT? It is to visualize impacted teeth, root morphology if there are dilacerations or resorption, there is a cleft lip or palate, orthognathic surgeries, craniofacial anomalies, TMJ pathology contributing to malocclusion, and to assess airway morphology, especially in obstructive sleep apnea, in which case you might have to use a larger FOB. So this is a chart of uh, assessment of treatment outcomes and indications in orthodontics and it is evidence-based used. So it's only indicated when you have a significant number of cases and you have impacted teeth, cleft palate, orthognathic surgery or craniofacial anomalies. The ones, it's important to uh, assess the benefit versus risk ratio. And cases where there is uh, the uh, inf enough information available with a two-dimensional imaging uh, and no clinical indicators for CBCT, it should be avoided. TMJ anatomy on CBCT can also be assessed quite well and it should be used to assess osseous joint components, cortical bone integrity, subcortical bone destruction, for example, in cases like osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. 
is important to remember once again for evaluation of soft tissue or the disc which is the uh, between the condylar head and the articular eminence it's important or articular fossa and MRI is the ideal source of imaging and not a CBCT because um, it will not be able to give you clear image of the disc. For 3D reconstructions, uh, CBCT can come to help. For example, this is a case of an OKC with an impacted molar. It allows you to assess the amount of bone destruction that is done by the uh, OKC and post-surgically what would be the area that needs to be reconstructed. Of course, in implant placement, CBCT is of utmost value. Um, the radiologic assessment of bone quality, height and width of the alveolar crest can be done. Greater cortical density and smaller trabecular spaces, successful osseointegration. And hence, the usage of CBCT in implant placement is multifolded and it can be of uh, help and definitely before placement of an implant, a CBCT scan of that particular area is highly recommended. So this is just a chart to show you comparison of 2D anatomy versus that of 3D. It allows you to see much closer how close the tooth is to the canal or are we missing any finding in that particular area and allows you to assess the area more clearly, especially for uh, complex anatomy and difficult cases. All in all, the strengths of CBCT would be its size. It has a small physical footprint. That means it occupies a less space in your office. It costs one fourth to one fifth of a conventional CT machine. The scan time is short, but not, what do we mean by short? <laughs> it's important to understand that. So like I told you, it takes about five to 10 seconds for actually scanning the patient and the literal scan time. But most of the time is actually spent explaining and setting up the patient for the scan. High resolution images, you can see uh, very uh, clear images and fine details of structures like the PDL space, root canal morphology and root fractures. Uh, of course, it's best to use a smaller FOV to get better resolution. There's relatively low patient radiation dose. Again, when we're talking about relatively, we are comparing it to a CT scan uh, in of the same particular area. So the effective dose ranges from 25 microsieverts to 1000 over microsieverts, depending on your field of view. Interactive analysis, definitely the software allows you to view it on your personal computer. You can burn it into a CD or even a pen drive. You can compress files and mail it to your friends and gives you a very beautiful uh, outlay or the interface which allows you to view the area exposed in three dimensions. And a lot of software tools are available which helps you measure or uh, the length or width or even the volume of the area that is to be assessed. When we're talking about relatively low radiation dose and its comparison to conventional CT scan, is it realistic? Well, when you're talking about a panoramic radiograph, the effective patient dose is about 24 microsieverts, let's say. So, um, dose is a multiple of dose from a typical panoramic exam if we say is 1. Then for a small field, field of view CBCT, it's about 2 to 27 times that of a panoramic radiograph. For a larger field of view CBCT, it's about 3 to 45 times that of a panoramic radiograph. Whereas a CT scan, computed tomography, not cone beam computed tomography, utilizes 22 to 88 times that of a panoramic radiograph. Now, CBCT also comes with its set of limitations. In comparison to conventional CT scan, there are uh, artifacts, which is called as image noise, due to a large portion of scattered radiation which happens, which increases with increased object thickness and image size. So, smaller FOVs, more uh, resolution. Larger the FOVs, more chances of scatter. Now, hence, it is advisable, like I told you, to always use the smallest FOV possible and you, there are softwares to reduce artifacts nowadays and there are methods to reduce these artifacts. But nevertheless, if you do have a lot of metal restorations in the oral cavity, you will end up getting a lot of scatter. So there is also poor soft tissue contrast. So CBCT is generally used for heart tissue structures, the tooth and the bone. 
Now, artifacts that can cause scatter or streaking are generally amalgam restorations, braces, prosthetic crowns, some things which you cannot take off uh, before the processing of this, before the scan, endodontic silver points, metallic ball markers, or lead foil used for implant marking. Now, there are methods if you are using a digital um, uh, scanning, then probably some of these can be avoided. Then objects which do not cause scatter are the implant itself because it's surrounded by bone. Gutta percha used in road canal therapy and used as an implant marker also doesn't cause uh, scatter. So it's mostly the metallic parts of uh, restorations or braces which are present in the oral cavity. When you are selecting a CBCT, it's important to note that the exposure factors to be adjusted on the basis of patient size. So Alara is something which you should keep in mind. So the justification of the use of CBCT should be done only if it's likely to alter your diagnosis. Are you having a better uh, diagnosis? So the potential diagnostic benefits versus risk must be weighed and it has to contribute to your treatment plan. So it's important to place special attention to pediatric patients, especially in children. The organs are closer to the primary x-ray beam, uh, like the thyroid gland, and hence there is higher organ dose. Developing tissues and organs are more sensitive to radiation risk. And you must not use CBCT as a routine screening examination, especially for pediatric uh, patients. Hence, it's important to do your patient selection very carefully. This is a sample of a referral form which allows you to aid in patient selection. Which type of radiograph do you want? Do you really need the uh, CBCT? Which scan area? If you're still not sure of these values and probably would circle out the teeth that you're interested to view and which is which side is it, which is the reasons for scanning. And then the radiographer will be able to advise you exactly what type of view you need. The essential elements of a CBCT report that is generated of the scan consists of patient information, scan information, radiologic findings and radiologic impression. Now most dentists can um, diagnose or interpret their own CBCT images but certain times complex anatomy is, knowledge is very important and if you are not confident then it's important that you take the opinion from the uh, oral radiologist. So when you're doing decision making and you're advising for a CBCT, it's important to keep in mind how many images do you need, how large an area do you wish to evaluate, is simple two-dimensional imaging enough to make a decision, does the diagnostic task really require a CBCT, what is your risk of missing an important finding and what is the impact on your office workflow. So these are important decisions which uh, have to be taken or kept in mind before a scan is advised. So in conclusion, a CBCT has advanced imaging, excellent visualization of dental heart tissue structures and osseous structures in three dimensions. The image is not recommended routinely in dental practice and therefore decision making in oral radiology is a balance between risk assessment and the diagnostic information reading. You must be not get into or be wowed by the factor of the three dimensional imaging and, and this is what is called as young practitioner risk or targeted by the manufacturers to sell you the machine or to get you to um, ask for CBCT images where you must understand not all your patients require it. Also, cost effectiveness must be evaluated. So the need for a radiologic report by a trained radiologist or an adequately trained general practitioner is also very important. So it's, uh, you must train yourself how to use the three-dimensional software, um, and, uh, which is not very difficult and can be done. And once you're confident, you wouldn't miss a finding in the scan. So these are some useful links. And please feel free to contact me should you have any doubts. Thank you.